I'm an alumni of uh, the CSE department here, and uh, I can say that my time at UCSD was uh, truly transformative, and uh, I really have lots of fond memories of uh, hanging out, not in this part of the building, because it wasn't here when I was uh, around, but uh, um, around the department. So uh, it's, it's real great to uh, be here to share what I've been working on. I should start by warning that uh, the content of this talk can be a little emotionally distressing. Um, you know, we're going to be touching on things like sexual and physical violence and other kind of harms that are being caused to uh, people. I asked beforehand if this was an appropriate topic for an alumni event. They said sure. So, uh, but you know, I hope to. You know, it's an important topic, really important, and I hope that we can leave you with a feeling of optimism that as technologists, that we can really make a positive difference in people's lives by rethinking how we build technology. So, with that, let me just start by saying the intimate partner violence, or what I'll uses an acronym IPV, is this gigantic uh, problem. So a relatively recent study from the CDC indicated that uh, about one out of four men and about one out, of ten, uh, one out of four women and one out of ten men will at some point in their lives suffer rape, physical violence, or uh, stalking by their husband, wife, boyfriend, or other form of intimate partner. So while we uh, tend to think of this as you know, focusing on physical or sexual violence, and this may seem kind of far removed from our lives as technologists. Um, to put this in perspective, if you kind of do some basic arithmetic based on these percentages, you know, this is about 360 million Facebook users and about uh, 252 million uh, Android users. And this begs the important question of what role technology is playing in these uh, intimate partner violence contexts. So unfortunately, a small uh, body of prior work by uh, academics as well as advocates indicates that we're not doing as well as we might like, and that, in fact, technology gets abused quite often in these contexts. Uh, people send harassing text messages. You know, there's discussion about GPS devices being used to track people's cars and these types of things. So these works raise a lot more questions than they provide answers, both in terms of like the scope of the types of abuse that goes on, as well as what types of things we can do to uh, improve the situation. And so what we've been doing is, well, we put together a group of kind of interdisciplinary researchers across you know, computer security, uh, people who do more user-facing research, measurement, uh, another uh, uh, Damon McCoy, who's uh, also uh, was a postdoc here at uh, UC San Diego. And our goal is to try to understand better the, the role of technology in intimate partner violence, as well as to think about how might, we might design or redesign our technical technology and our socio-technical systems in order to improve you know, victim safety and well-being. So today I'll talk about a sequence of projects that we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, we were very fortunate being located in New York City that we could collaborate with the uh, New York City Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, which is the municipal organization responsible for helping uh, victims, and uh, do a study where we got to interview and talk to uh, many victims as well as uh, professionals who work with them. And then I'll talk about some measurement studies that we did looking at particularly at the technical tools that uh, abusers seem to be using for spying, monitoring on mobile devices uh, of victims. And then finally, I'll talk about what we've been doing in our ongoing work to try to build kind of positive interventions to uh, help victims of uh, intimate partner violence navigate their kind of complex technical issues in a, in a way that, in a, an approach that we've been referring to as clinical computer security. So to start, uh, the New York City uh, area is really fortunate to have this uh, great organization, the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, which I'll sometimes uh, refer to as NGBV. And they, in particular, run uh, a set of family justice centers, which are these kind of one-stop shops for uh, survivors to go get uh, help uh, with their situations. They you know, provide uh, access to legal services, housing support if they're trying to escape you know, physically from a situation, uh, access to NYPD domestic violence units, um, and, and more. It's a really great organization. So they have uh, offices in each of these family justice centers in each of the neighborhoods of New York City. And this provided us an avenue by which we could recruit uh, participants to tr start trying to understand the ecosystem of technology abuse um, in these IPV contexts. So we were able to recruit uh, eventually, or to perform eventually, 11 focus groups with uh, 39 uh, uh, victims, uh, who all happen to be women. The, in this context, in the Family Justice Center context, they refer to survivors as clients. They're the clients of the center. They go there to get help. Uh, so I'll often use the term clients for them. And these 
uh, clients came from a variety of, of backgrounds, both, both demographically and, and in terms of whether they're living with their abusive partner still or had escaped the situation, et cetera. We we're also able to talk to a large number of professionals. So these are the case managers, the social workers, the psychiatrists, the uh, police, uh, and others who are working you know, every day on the front line with uh, clients to try to help them with their uh, issues. So in these uh, focus groups and in these one-on-one -on -one interviews with professionals, we asked about technology issues, like what types of things are coming up in, in people's situations. Uh, and this led to just you know, hours and hours and hours and thousands of pages of transcripts, uh, some of the kind of richest data um, to date uh, on this topic. So we did a very careful reading of these, um, these uh, transcripts and did uh, what's called inductive coding. So we basically tried to let uh, surface some of the common themes that seem to be coming up over and over again in our discussions with them. And this led to a, you know, a kind of list of topics. So here's the, the top ones in terms of prevalence in our, in our code, in our uh, data. So Facebook came up all over and over and over again as a, a point of issue, abuser device access, you know, physical abuse, manipulation, et cetera. So one of the benefits of, of meeting with, uh, directly with people who are you know, the subject of abuse is that we can get a really high fidelity understanding of their situation. And it was really kind of inspiring to meet with these survivors. Uh, you know, they're very strong and they're hopeful that you know, by meeting with us and telling us about what they had gone through, uh, we could um, learn and help other people in the future. And so I'm gonna actually read uh, a couple stories uh, that have been anonymized to protect, of course, the uh, anonymity and privacy of the participants, but we've nevertheless tried to retain some of the voice of the, uh, 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 the clients, and this can be a little heavy, so uh, be warned. So, I was raised in a country in which women are trained to serve men. I'll say that he never hit me, basically, but he did the worst thing ever. Honestly, I would probably rather that he hit me instead of the things that he did to me. So he put spyware in our computer, Obviously, I didn't know because he studied computer programming, so he was very savvy about it. He went into my computer, he got my Facebook password, email password, and he shared naked pictures of me. He sent them from his Facebook to my bosses, he took my phone, and he sent them through private messages to several friends, but also through my email and my Facebook because he had the password. The embarrassment that I went through, the public humiliation, it beat me to the ground. So even in this just one story, we see all sorts of ways in which technology is being kind of weaponized by the abuser. Uh, you know, using ownership of a shared computing device to install spyware on, uh, to monitor the victim, compromising her accounts, uh, posting non-consensual intimate imagery, which is kind of the, the jargon from the, that professionals use that's more colloquially referred, colloquially referred to as revenge porn. Uh, you know, physically stealing a device to get access to things, and then even impersonating the victim online in order to cause uh, problems for her. And this was pretty, this wasn't like a one-off. This is a very common type of story. We hear that technology is being employed in many, many ways. It's kind of multimodal in terms of the attacks. And what we did is we stepped back and tried to categorize the various types of, of, of attacks that we heard about in these uh, interviews. The first type is what we call ownership-based attacks. And this basically arises because in many of these situations, the abuser is actually the one that owns the accounts or devices that the uh, victim is using. You know, they set up the computer for them, they buy the phone and pay for the data plan, et cetera. Even when they don't own the devices or uh, accounts, they may have the ability to easily compromise them. They may compel disclosure of passwords or be able to easily guess the passwords that are being used or other means of authentication. Um, the, uh, either way, whether they own the accounts or devices or can access them, this gives them access to do all sorts of harms, right? Destroying data. We often heard about uh, victims who kept logs about abuse and then, and then the abuser would use access to delete these logs so they couldn't be used in court. Um, installing spyware like we heard about in the story, et cetera. There's just a whole host of, of issues. And there's another couple categories of attacks that don't rely on uh, compromising victim uh, you know, digital uh, assets. Uh, just harmful messages or posts were very prevalent. Um, so you get hundreds of you know, kind of abusive messages per day on SMS or via uh, WhatsApp or these types of things. Um, posting harmful content, you know, threatening violence on social media, on Facebook. Uh, and then things like proxy harassment, which I hadn't heard of before uh, doing the study, but where you kind of enlist your common friends or family members to try to harass the victim kind of on your behalf. Uh, very complicated kind of social uh, fabric there. 
And then finally, the exposure of private information. So we heard about the non-consensual intimate images, um, but you could also threaten, say, victims with outing their HIV status, something we heard about. Um, or we hear a lot of cases in which uh, abusers will set up fake profiles on dating services as if they are the victim and then send people, set up dates, you know, uh, with people uh, unbeknownst to the victim. So again, in that previous client story, we saw like many of these examples. In fact, that was only a snippet of the, the unfortunate things that she went through. And there was many other uh, problems that arose in, in her particular situation. So I'll just read one more client story, and then we'll move on to some kind of higher level um, uh, takeaways. I was mentally, emotionally, and verbally abused, and I finally had enough and filed an order of protection because of the social media abuse. He would hack into all my social media accounts and post that I cheated. I wasn't allowed to have any social media account without him having it on his phone. I would set up my password, but I would have to give it to him. He asked me said, and said, if you don't consent to this, we have to break up. He was reading every single conversation I had. He was uploading my text messages from iPhone to another Apple device. It just automatically goes. I don't even know how it really worked. Uh, it was through iCloud. Because he hacked and changed my name and birthday and security questions and took over my entire account, put my iPhone on lost and erase mode. For email, he changed all of my passwords. When I went to go log in and reset my password, a text message would go to his phone. So again, we see account compromise prevalently coming up. Uh, the kind of weaponizing of a standard tool like iCloud, which backs up data from the phone, uh, and now using what we'll, we'll hear a lot about is dual use tools, right? Regular software that has legitimate purpose, but it's being repurposed by the abuser to monitor the victim, uh, deleting information, and then uh, locking the victim out of the account. This is a, one of these things like two-factor authentication, which uh, you know they send a challenge to your phone to help get into an account is it considered usually a, a good thing, but here it's being used against the victim, preventing them from getting access to their account again. And just again, to maybe belabor the point, uh, we're seeing that there's lots and lots of complicated issues that are coming up for these victims in terms of technology. So um, I'll talk now about like kind of two high-level themes that emerge from our uh, qualitative work. You know, one is that the non-technical infrastructure is not really doing as much uh, to help victims uh, as we would like. And then I'll talk about the technical issues with how we think about computer security tools in a moment. So as I mentioned, these family justice centers are these great one-stop shops. Uh, clients can come in either just walking in off the street or they get referred because of a domestic violence incident from the NYPD or um, uh, from a hospital. And then they have a case manager who basically helps them figure out what types of services they need access to. If they need to get housing for them and their children, you know, they go to see a housing officer if they need mental health services, uh, legal services, et cetera. Interestingly, in the, in the year, -long, year long, a little bit more than a year long study, the number of people that were trained in technology that we met, uh, you know, people with a computer science or other background uh, was zero. So there's just no one in this ecosystem helping victims who has you know, training in the uh, technology sphere. And uh, moreover, there's not really any uh, standardized best practices for evaluating technology issues, right? It's very uh, up to the individual experiences of the uh, um, professionals uh, and having heard about issues. And they have started doing some trainings uh, for advocates, but uh, it's pretty early days. So perhaps unsurprisingly, victims uh, really felt that they uh, didn't have sufficient technology understanding to deal with the types of technology abuse they're seeing. And like ubiquitously, they felt that the abusers uh, had, were more technologically savvy than they are. Perhaps a little bit more concerningly, the professionals basically said the same things, that uh, they also lack uh, technology um, understanding. And basically what goes on is a client comes in and works with a case manager and they report that, oh yeah, he's sending me harassing messages on some app like Kick, which I had never heard of before the yeah, discussion or the interview. And so the case manager, who like me, maybe has never heard of it, says, okay, well, they start Googling basically to figure out what's going on and uh, try to get help to help, uh, try information to help them. And this was so prevalent that we just refer to this as Googling as they go, which is kind of the on the job training that uh, comes up with technology issues. So in addition to the kind of non-technical infrastructure being, you know, obviously lots of room for improvement, there's uh, a lot of uh, issues with our technical mechanisms. Um, and in particular, if we think of our security tools, the main point here is that the, our security tools are designed for threat models that don't really match the types of attacks that we're seeing in the IPv context. 
So we heard a lot about hacking, and I think that word already came up a few times. They hacked into my phone, they hacked into blah. It's just like the parlance that everybody uses for this. When I hear about hacking, of course, I think about you know some image like this. Maybe that's in the basement of the building here, and uh, you know think about sophisticated kind of uh, attacks where you're you know writing exploits and um, you know rootkitting systems. But this is not what was going on, right? This, this is technically sophisticated stuff, and in fact. The types of attacks we heard about are not technically sophisticated, at least from the perspective of a computer security expert. Um, in, but that doesn't mean they're not effective. In fact, they're horrendously effective, and it doesn't mean that they're easy to deal with, uh, as we'll see. The reason uh, these attacks, while not being technically sophisticated, work is because the threat models uh, under which most of our security tools operate don't really match the threats in this context. So threat model just specifies you know, who is an attacker uh, and who is the victim, and what are the attacker's capabilities, you know, what resources do they have, um, and what are their goals. So it's just one very simple but ubiquitous example. If we think about a password uh, to, uh, mechanism for you know, gain, uh, protecting access to an online account, you know, conventionally we think of the, the, the threat uh, of the attacker as kind of some stranger on the internet who uh, doesn't know necessarily the victim personally. Um, and is connecting and trying to access their account remotely from some other uh, location. But in this IPv context, uh, the attacker is you know, this intimate partner who not only knows the victim personally, may just be able to guess uh, how passwords are chosen um, or compel disclosure of them. They may be connecting from the same home as the victim does. They may even be using the same device. And so if you know how modern authentication mechanisms work beyond the password, that's a hint that many of our typical tools for catching these type of um, uh, accesses uh, aren't going to work. There's many other examples, uh, like fake accounts, right? We have modern services like Facebook and Twitter have some protections in place to detect fake accounts. But these are typically geared towards these kind of commercially motivated attackers that set up lots of accounts uh, that are kind of basically bots and are being used for spam and other commercial purposes. And they don't catch the types of customized, you know, one person sitting down and making an account in order to avoid, uh, you know, say, being blocked on Facebook so they can continue harassment. Uh, similarly with abusive content, right, we hear a lot about uh, abusers sending kind of coded uh, messages. So you're sending a picture of a gun to a victim is clearly a threat in the context of that person's life. Uh, but, you know, Facebook doesn't have a policy, say, of not allowing gun pictures online, right? So there's a big gap between the types of issues that are coming up there and, and the general uh, security mechanisms. Further complex complexifying, if that's not a word, but I'll make it up here, uh, the issues is that the, you know, obvious solutions don't really work very well given the context. So something we heard about a lot is hey, just get off technology. If Facebook is a problem, get off Facebook. You know, if you think your phone has spyware, get a new phone. And these things don't work in a lot of cases. They work sometimes, but, but, but more often not. Uh, for example, shutting off contact with the abuser is not even possible in most situations. Like if you have shared custody of children, you're legally obligated to keep communicating with the, uh, the abuser. Uh, so shutting off is not an option. Getting new devices, of course, can be hard, depending on your socioeconomic situation. And getting off social media is like further punishment in some ways for the victim, right? You're now saying you can't connect with your friends and family for support. On Facebook, you have to get off of it completely. Or we heard a lot about people being um, uh, having a hard time because they're trying to get a job and they need to use LinkedIn to help advertise themselves, but then this outs them to their abuser and causes problems. One final complexity is uh, escalation, uh, which is this idea that as you try and cut off technical uh, technology uh, block you know, tech abuse, this might trigger some kind of escalation of the abuse to physical confrontations. Um, this is a well-known problem in other aspects of uh, um, intimate partner violence, but comes up with technology as well. So if you just deleted spyware off of a phone, that could be dangerous, uh, more dangerous than leaving it there uh, in some situations. And finally, some victims really did want to have some limited communication. This is very surprising to me, even if they weren't legally obligated to do it. Uh, but the reason hindsight makes a lot of sense, they, it gives them a little bit of a window into the state of mind of the abuser and may actually give them some warning about you know, upcoming um, attacks. All right, so to recap, um, you know, tech abuse is widespread. Basically, every single uh, person we talked to had some technology-related issues uh, in their uh, abuse situation. Um, these attacks are multifaceted, they're persistent. Um, the situations end up being very, very nuanced. Our non-technical approaches, kind of our infrastructure needs help. We need better training. Um, and also, our technical, how we design security tools could do a significantly better job in, in addressing these IPv threat models. 
And very, very importantly, uh, you know, we really need to take into account the that you know, proposed solutions need to take into account the full kind of context. It's kind of easy to throw something over the fence and maybe cause more harm than good. All right, so with that, I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about technical measurement we study to try and address one of the issues that came up during the uh, qualitative work that we thought maybe we should be able to have some traction to make progress on. That's this issue of, of spyware. So we heard a lot about um, uh, tools, third-party tools being installed on victim devices in order to monitor their location and the content of their communications. And indeed, you can see uh, online there's you know, some examples of uh, news stories talking about, for example, uh, tools like FlexiSpy, which are advertised to abusers. At the same time, we heard that, uh, that the state of the art uh, for detection of spyware in practice uh, is quite poor. Um, basically, what would happen is that there would be a discussion between a case manager, uh, one who's savvy enough to know about spyware, and uh, the client, and if the client reported things like, oh, you know, the phone's kind of glitchy, it's, the battery's been draining quickly, um, or perhaps you know, like the only plausible explanation for some of the information that the abuser has is that they got it off the phone, then the conclusion right there and then was, oh, you probably have spyware on your phone, you should throw away your phone. Um, so there are no technical tools for evaluating whether there's spyware on the phone, despite, that we have, despite the fact that we have lots of, uh, you know, other types of malware detection tools out there. And in, importantly, there's no prior work academically or otherwise really digging deeply into this IPv spyware uh, ecosystem. So we took on the perspective like, okay, well, let's start trying to understand this ecosystem. So we start by thinking, oh, you know, if I was a would-be abuser, what, um, how would I get information about uh, spyware tools? And the obvious answer is, well, how you get information about anything these days, you go to Google and you start Googling for it um, or your favorite search engine. So if you uh, go to your favorite search engine and uh, type in something like how to spy on my husband, you get uh, a large number of, of resources that are helpful to you. Um, so you get blog posts that comparing the various features of different uh, spyware apps. You get YouTube has lots of how-to guides about how to install and configure uh, spyware tools. Um, you get links to web pages that are essentially ad funnels. They're web pages talking about, you know, um, uh, infidelity and these types of things, but then all just linked to a particular spyware uh, web page. And then indeed you get uh, links to particular spyware apps being, uh, that you can download uh, directly. So we want to get a kind of coverage of the set of terms that uh, we think were likely you know, to be used by abusers. Um, to get better coverage, right? We didn't want to just be limited to the viewpoint that you know, like my laptop uh, has. Um, and so we were able to take advantage of the fact that search engines now helpfully give you uh, suggestions about queries that other people are likely to give. So there's like this auto completion thing, right? If you just type how to spy on my, you get this list of suggestions. Um, you also get you know, other related searches back. And so this is nice because it could allow us to do something that we call snowball searching. So if you um, start with a small seed set of, of queries, and uh, then use these search engine interfaces to get back suggestions uh, based on what other people were searching on, they're related to it, uh, then you can uh, you know, filter out some of the obvious false positives. Like for example, if you search for things like spy, you often get like spy video games and these types of things, so you can try and filter some of this stuff. But because these search engine interfaces are really good at giving recommendations, this helps us often find new uh, um, queries that we can then add to our set and then repeat. And so kind of keep growing the, uh, the set of interesting terms and consequently the set of results that we have access to. So uh, this, uh, we did this on Google and actually if you do it on google.com, you, you get such a huge number of uh, URLs very quickly that uh, it's kind of overwhelming, but we kind of did some an manual analysis uh, to understand what we found from that. And, um, in particular, we were able to, we discovered lots of resources for abusers, but in specifically we were able to find a 23 kind of uh, apps that are really advertised uh, overtly to be used as spyware. Sometimes they're advertised for abuse settings um, quite explicitly, you know, there's like pictures of abuse on the web page. Uh, and sometimes it's more about like parental control software and stuff, as we'll see. Um, and these are, uh, for the moment, I'll just talk about what we found in terms of off-store apps. So these are apps that are not on the official Android and iPhone iTunes app stores, but um, can nevertheless be used on those phones. So to give you a sense, a typical off-store app, um, uh, let's just give one example. There's lots that are kind of very similar. Uh, this is something called Spizy. Uh, the ultimate edition costs $39.99 a month. Uh, 
It uh, is advertised as an all-inclusive mobile phone uh, app. You know, it allows uh, historical and real-time location tracking of, of the victim phone. You know, it can allow you to remotely turn on audio to record audio and, and, and video. Uh, you can also change settings on the phone. It's covert. Uh, you can hide it from the application tray in Android. So you know, there's usually an icon associated with each app on your phone. But you can hide that to make it covert. And then importantly, it doesn't require anything technically sophisticated on behalf of the person installing. The, uh, you don't have to root or jailbreak the phone. Uh, all you have to do is conf you know, change the Android configuration in particular to allow like, uh, installing third-party apps, and then you're good to go. So from the user's perspective, this ends up being a very easy, easy uh, experience uh, in terms of installation and, and use. And installation is really easy. We downloaded a lot of these apps and installed them on test phones and, and checked out the features. Um, takes just a few minutes to set it up. And even if you did get confused, remember there's all those guides online that can give you video guides about how to do this. On the abuser's end, you end up getting this fancy or relatively fancy web user interface, uh, which is something like this. Um, and it gives you access to various things like all the Facebook messages and activity, all the phone uh, pictures that are taken on the phone, et cetera. I should say as a side point that we actually discovered in some of these apps very, very bad uh, vulnerabilities in the web sites of these things that allow you to like download all the photos from every single device that the uh, 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 spyware has been installed on. These guys are not very technically sophisticated in terms of security, which led to a very interesting disclosure process because these companies were... Uh, a little sleazy. Um, I can tell you more about that later. So uh, we wanted to. We also found uh, references to on-store apps, so apps that were on the official Google and uh, iPhone, uh, iTunes uh, app stores. And so we want to dig into that more. So we did a, a further measurement study on the Google Play Store for three months, where we did this snowball searching approach. Um, and this ended up giving us, you know, a lot of of apps that, you know. Uh, came up in response to these types of searches. Not all of these, of course, are actually usable as spyware. Um, and so what we did is built a machine learning model to help us kind of prune false positives. This thing uses features, you know, the app title, the description, permissions, other metadata about the apps that's available on the website, uh, on the Play Store website. And we tuned this uh, machine learning classifier to really favor uh, having a low false negative rate, um, but still allowed us to prune lots of false positives. And then we manually kind of went over the resulting list and still ended up with kind of a large number of apps. This may seem surprisingly uh, large, and, and that's because we were being in many ways very paranoid about what types of things could be used as, um, uh, as spyware. Um, in fact, there was this kind of constant uh, discussion back and forth between me and my grad students saying, oh, you know, surely this Dropbox clone app that's just doing synchronization of files or something isn't, you know, spyware, right? This isn't something we should be considering. And then the grad student would point to a website teaching people how to use that thing to, you know, say, siphon off pictures or something from a phone. So we have to be very expansive there. We did a very small uh, user study, a, a smaller study on iTunes and found a similarly a, a, a few hundred apps. So what are all these apps that are on the official app stores? We divide them into three categories. So there's these uh, so-called personal tracking devices. So these are things like Find My Phone or anti-theft devices. Um, there's automatic call recording type things or you know, data uh, synchronization like these Dropbox clones I just mentioned, um, et cetera. Then there's this idea of mutual tracking uh, apps. So these are like find my family or find my friend style apps you know, where you install on both sides and uh, these uh, keep location tabs, if not other information about both sides. There's actually a whole subgenre of these which are advertised to couples, I think primarily teenagers, but not necessarily who uh, advertise them for tracking each other, um, which is very strange to me. Um, and then there's what we call subordinate tracking, and this is probably one of the, the more sophisticated set of tools which uh, allow installing on a subordinate, in this case like an employee uh, or a child, uh, in order to monitor their use of the phone. Um, uh, and, and these are quite powerful. So again, this is you know one of these Things and a lot of these are very legitimate apps. You know, anti-theft is a totally socially reasonable thing. You may want to work, find your app after it, uh, your device after it's been stolen. Um, but these things are being used as, as spyware. So, just give you one example of this. Um, this is a quote from a, a blog or a cute question and answer site online. And you know, someone posts on there, "Hey, I'm looking for an app I can install on my wife's phone that is hidden so that I can see where she is 
is or has been, et cetera. So someone replied to this question very helpfully, saying, hey, you know what you should do is go install this, this tool Cerberus from the Play Store market. Indeed, Cerberus is uh, uh, you know, an app that's on the official app store. It's advertised for use in anti-theft uh, situations. So everything the developers are writing about the app is saying, hey, you should, this is for um, uh, tracking and controlling your device if in case it gets lost. Uh, nevertheless, it has all the features uh, that an abuser uh, would like. And, and this, this answer kind of goes on to say, hey, you know, you can make this thing invisible in the app drawer. You can record audio and take pictures remotely with it. Um, and you know, be sure to silence the camera first, though, so the victim isn't, doesn't get wise. So we refer to these as dual-use apps, this idea that you know, they may be set up for legitimate purpose, but are easily repurposed for uh, abuse um, by uh, abusers. Um, and so uh, to, to summarize, we found uh, not only um, 23 off-store apps that are kind of mostly advertised as overt spyware, but we also found you know, a lots and lots of apps that are what fall, mostly fall into this dual use category, okay? Apps that are easy to repurpose. But in an IPv setting, of course, it's really critical if, to catch these types of apps um, as well um, because they can be dangerous to the, to the victim. Many of these apps actually violated Play Store policies, at least in our, from our perspective. And so we went through a disclosure process with Google to let them know about what we found. Um, and I'm happy to say that Google kind of reacted very quickly by, uh, in ways that uh, should uh, help uh, improve safety for their customers. Um, and particularly, they tighten enforcement. They actually now disallow, apparently, any app that's advertising itself as a mutual couple tracking app. Um, they took down a bunch of videos that violated their Play Store policies. And then they actually extended uh, restrictions on ad serving and Play Store search. So I didn't um, uh, go over this, but we actually did a, a little bit of a study to understand to what extent these developers are actually kind of condoning intimate partner violence. Um, and many of them are actually, if you Google for things like track my girlfriend, you'll get back paid advertisements for these family control software. Um, so the, the, the advertisement and the website for the app will just talk about you know, child safety and protecting your children from harm, but you know, they're showing up as a paid advertisement um, for track my girlfriend or track my spouse. They also, as I mentioned briefly, there's this whole network of affiliate networks of ad funnels. So you have all these web pages that are blogs that basically talk about how important it is to catch your uh, partner in if they're being cheating on you. Uh, and these will have just, uh, just links to a particular spyware app. And so the, we don't have any hard evidence of this, but presumably what's going on is these developers are paying you know, or otherwise in cahoots with these uh, people running these blogs. Uh, in order to try and drive traffic and, and therefore revenue. Um, finally, we um, went ahead and, and contacted customer support uh, for about 11 of these uh, apps and uh, basically posed as, a, as an abuser saying, hey, you know, is, your, is your software good for uh, tracking my husband? And nine of the 11 responded. One, uh, uh, tool to their credit said no, you know, that's not what this tool is for. It's for, you know, childhood child safety and that's probably legal what you're suggesting. So don't do that. The other eight uh, of the nine that responded responded with something uh, along the lines of yeah, our tool is awesome for that. Here's how you set it up to use it for uh, tracking your husband. So it's pretty clear that uh, many of these uh, uh, spyware developers are on the seedy end of the, the spectrum. Um, you know, our work got some uh, media attention uh, with the New York Times article, and this uh, got some, you know, there's a U.S. senator who got kind of excited about it, and so we talked to his office, and apparently they sent some letters to some of these app vendors asking them what the heck is going on. Uh, and I don't, I'm not familiar with all the details because part, other part of the group was like dealing with this, but um, apparently some of the app vendors replied, yeah, we're working with those researchers to fix these problems, which is <laughs> interesting because we're not. Um, we also disclosed some of the vulnerable, I mentioned these uh, web portals that are vulnerable to attacks. We, we actually ended up disclosing to the, to the companies, they didn't reply, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, and we also talked to the FTC about it, but the FTC doesn't tell us what, they're, what they did with the information. Okay, so um, obviously uh, this is like helpful you know, first steps in trying to rectify the problem, but the fact remains that 
even if we got rid of all of the really bad actors in this ecosystem, we're still going to have what are the, called these dual use apps, right? Things that can be used to monitor locations. Uh, even if you just think about like Google Maps on your phone, right? It can be configured to, uh, to track locations. So we need to understand how to detect these things when we're helping victims. So we started by looking at existing uh, uh, technology tools um, and particularly did snowball searching on the Play Store for like anti-spyware and we got back lots of hits. These range from very uh, established antivirus vendors like Spursky, McAfee, et cetera, to a bunch of like um, tools that we had never heard of before. So we went ahead and did a, a small measurement study to look at how effective these tools are in detecting uh, the types of spyware we had found. So we took some, uh, some test phones and installed just a lot of spyware on them and uh, also then installed uh, some of these antivirus things and then just checked, you know, did, did the antivirus find stuff. So uh, the established kind of firms did an okay job at, at finding kind of the overt off-store spyware apps. Not perfect, unfortunately, but better. Um, you know, with like 90% and like 70% uh, success rates. These are just two examples of the best performers. Uh, McAfee and Norton. On the, for the on-store apps, they performed abysmally. But this makes sense. Uh, and this is exactly one of these examples of where our typical threat models, which in this case is like other types of malware, don't match up to the threat uh, being uh, seen in IPV, which is this type of spyware. In most contexts, it would be a false positive to uh, say that, you know, find my friends, uh, find my friend style app is a kind of something you should worry about. I won't say much about these other, uh, uh, these other non-mainstream things. These are mostly junk. Uh, they basically just looked at the permissions that were being used. Are you trying to ask for the microphone? If you ask for lots of permissions in your app, then it's labeled as spyware. It has bad false positive rates. I wouldn't recommend looking at those things. Okay, so as a recap of uh, the spyware uh, study, so A, there's this just large ecosystem. Really, there's a cottage industry of kind of uh, people building apps that can be used as uh, IPv spyware, and in some cases are being advertised uh, for that purpose. Um, there's a much broader set of apps that uh, fall into this category of what we call dual use, um, which are just things that can be easily repurposed by the abuser to uh, spy on a victim. Uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, briefly, you know, some of these developers are condoning intimate partner violence quite directly. Um, and our existing anti-spyware tools are just not cutting it in terms of detection. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of bad news, I guess, uh, um, the first two-thirds of the talk. And so now we're going to we'll all switch gears and start talking about what types of things we can do to try to make uh, positive improvements uh, and uh, improve safety outcomes for uh, victims in this context. So. The, there's a lot of things that come to mind that we could improve on. There's lots of low-hanging fruit, so to speak, uh, though it's going to take a lot of work to uh, take advantage of it. Um, so the first things that come to mind, things that we're talking to people about, is obviously improving training for advocates, right? Like as we said, there weren't any best practices for how to spot techni technical technology abuse or other problems. Uh, and indeed, the NGBV in New York City is, you know, they run training programs, but uh, they could surely use more. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this Googling as they go thing is the primary way people get information about how to deal with these uh, problems. And unfortunately, there's a lot more resources online for abusers than for victims. And so one obvious thing to do is try to improve the uh, uh, online security advice materials that people rely on. And then on the technology side, there's just a, a because of these kind of gaps between the threat models uh, under which we've been primarily designing our security tools and, and what's going on in IPV, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to revisit technology design and security mechanism design. So, for example, we have been thinking about, like, oh, how do you kind of build into your software engineering design process safety reviews for IPv settings? If you think about a new feature that you're going to deploy, you should probably think about what might happen in an abuse setting. Um, or maybe, you know, Android and other mobile operating systems can actually, the operating system can be improved to, like, do better restrictions and define their interfaces in ways that make it harder to build apps that are uh, abusable. Um, or finally, you know, detection of abuser access to accounts, right? We have lots of ideas about how you might do this, though it seems hard to actually uh, actualize. So we're working on, or, or at least thinking about all these things. I'm actually happy to talk to people who are excited to work on, on these topics, too. There's lots of work that can be done. Unfortunately, I think even if we kind of pick off most of these things, it's probably not going to be enough to help uh, victims in the short term. So it's necessary, but not really sufficient. And the reason is that these IPV contexts, these, these situations that people are in are just incredibly complicated. Um, 
remember we saw in these client stories that it's just like every piece of technology they're touching in their kind of landscape of technology is being potentially exploited against them. And it's, it's uh, I think, unfortunately naive to think we're going to fix all of these different products in ways that will be absolutely perfect for uh, victims. So we think we need another approach. And that's what we've been calling this idea of clinical computer security. So uh, when a victim comes into a family justice center and they have problems with you know, legal issues. We don't send them to a website that says, like, here's the law, go figure it out yourself. What do we do? We have them go talk to a lawyer, right? When they come in and they have mental health problems, uh, you don't, you know, send them to WebMD and have them self-diagnose, right? You have them talk to a psychiatrist or a, a therapist. So similarly, when they come in and they say, oh, we have technology problems, we shouldn't just be you know, pushing them onto some website somewhere. Instead, we want to uh, probably extend the range of services that are available to them so they can get access to talk to someone who is kind of trained to help them with their technology issues. And this is what this idea of clinical computer security that we're thinking of, that we can train uh, technologists, people with a technology background, who can be either volunteers uh, or maybe even professionals. And they can assist uh, clients via kind of face-to-face -face interactions where you discuss with them their technology issues and uh, also have some tooling to help with uh, investigating their devices and uh, accounts. So this is not something that exists right now. There's a few like prototypes that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so it raises lots of questions about how to go about doing this, right? How do we recruit and train volunteers? You know, how should consultations work? How do we evaluate outcomes? What types of software tools or other types of tools do we need in order to uh, improve, uh, to facilitate these types of uh, consultations? And so there's lots of stuff to do here, but we've just been getting started uh, by trying to prototype in the last uh, six or seven months uh, this type of clinical computer security service in New York City. So we partnered up with the, uh, as, as, as should be routine by now in this talk, the NGBV, uh, in order to kind of build a, a consultation uh, prototype that we've actually been evaluating last uh, few months. So it's a, it's a referral model, so we don't just take people off the street, but we have them referred to us by a case manager uh, or other professional at the FJC. Uh, and then they come in and we sit down with them, and we have an appointment and we sit down with them and start to asking them questions like, oh, you know, what brought you in today? What type of technology issues are you having? And we have a kind of a, a semi-structured conversation about it. Very early on, I realized these types of conversations are very complicated. People come in with like four or five devices. They have like 10 different online accounts. It's like super complicated to, to tease apart their digital footprint, uh, particularly in the context of having an adversary who's actively trying to undermine those uh, technologies. So we started having to build uh, instruments to help with these um, discussions. And so, for example, we um, uh, designed this thing called the Technology Assessment Questionnaire, or TAC-10 which is just a, a list of 10 questions that uh, speak to uh, types of problems that come up, came up over and over again in our qualitative work. But it's very helpful when you're talking to a client because you can refer back to it and check off, you know, oh, we talked about social media safety, we talked about um, other things. We also built a spyware scanning tool. So there's a piece of software that runs on a laptop that you can uh, plug uh, the client devices, phones into over USB. And basically what the tool does is it dumps a manifest of all of the apps that are installed on the um, device in order to then check it versus, uh, against a blacklist of, uh, of apps that we know could be dangerous in these situations. Um, we also have some other heuristics, like if you know, spy or track ends up in the name of the app, even if we haven't seen the app before, then we flag it. And this helps the consultant basically, like, you know, we surface the ones that seem higher risk up at the top, and then we can kind of talk through those things with the, uh, the you know, the client. Is this an app you installed? You know, where does this come from, et cetera? In addition to this type of programmatic uh, investigation of devices, we also have some protocols for doing manual investigation of, like, configurations. So, for example, it's really important to check uh, on a phone who the account owner is on that phone, right? More, many times it'll be the abuser's email address to which all the information from the phone is being synced, um, or looking at Facebook privacy settings or these types of things. And again, for these, we kind of needed some cribs because there's a wide diversity of uh, tools, uh, of, of uh, uh, devices and sites out there. It's actually hard to remember how to use all of these different uh, websites. Um, so then if we find uh, some problem, right, like a, an app that the uh, victim didn't realize was installed, or maybe we see that the iCloud uh, sync email is actually the abusers and not the victims, uh, we actually don't do anything right then. We, don't, we try to discourage them from taking any immediate action. 
uh, because we want to engage in a kind of handoff uh, to do safety planning with a professional uh, case manager or, uh, uh, or other professional. And this is really important because as I mentioned before, these issues with escalation, right? If you do a knee-jerk reaction like, hey, delete that spyware, um, and you do, that could be very dangerous for the victim. Um, and so we don't want to, we want to have a, a conversation with someone who knows a lot more about the context of that particular person's uh, abuse situation. Um, and so this was actually one of the things that took a lot of time to work out is how we do these handoffs in a safe way. Um, so the progress so far, and this, that's kind of the, the idea in, in of how we're doing this. Um, in the summer and fall last year, we basically did an iterative design process with stakeholders, doing focus groups with dozens of professionals to get feedback on what we were planning to do and how we kind of went about it. Um, and uh, once we felt comfortable and they felt comfortable with everything, we went and got official approval from the NGBV to uh, then start meeting with clients. And actually, this iterative design process is still ongoing as we kind of learn more as we meet with clients. So in November, December, we were able to meet uh, so far with like 22 clients across various uh, boroughs in um, New York City, scanned a total of 33 devices. We discovered um, potential spyware apps or browser extensions uh, on you know, three of the uh, clients, uh, for three different clients on three different devices. Um, we also found several cases of kind of abusive configurations in terms of uh, uh, you know, iCloud and these types of things. And there's been lots of demand, so we're continuing to do this this semester. And, and so far, you know, anecdotally at least, the, the, uh, uh, there's been a lot of positive reactions to it. So just very briefly, I, I mean, I think while we're, we've been focusing and are going to continue to focus for a little while on, on IPV, uh, this idea of clinical computer security, I think, is probably something that's going to be of more general utility. You know, as we think about how we as individuals rely so heavily on technology in our lives, if you unfortunately become the target of uh, some uh, relatively persistent attack, uh, this can be quite debilitating in your life, right? And uh, we think probably having people who are trained to help, uh, like a, in crisis situations, um, with these type of computer insecurity problems could be really helpful. And so we're hoping that we can build a more generalizable theory of, of clinical computer security, you know, by first uh, finding other case study areas that could be useful um, uh, places where other people are having problems, maybe child abuse or uh, um, uh, child abuse or elder abuse, or even we've been thinking about like other targeted populations like journalists and politicians who are often actually receiving a lot of, uh, of um, attacks, maybe not from intimate partners, but from uh, other people who are quite dedicated. There could be a role for this type of consultation type service with them. And that, so anyway, this brings up a host of questions about, you know, okay, what types of clinical models do we need? What type of service models are best for various situations? Uh, how do we train up and build, like, you know, volunteer networks? So, like, one thing we're thinking about doing right now is trying to get a volunteer uh, organization up and running in New York City to uh, take it from the research into a more sustainable long-term uh, uh, program. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of legal issues and forensics. I didn't touch on legal problems, but there's a lot of uh, very interesting nuanced uh, questions involving how the law intersects with technology abuse that we've been thinking about. And, and anyway, there's lots of uh, interesting work to do. OK, so with that, I'm just going to wrap up and say that uh, we've been working for a long time on, well, now three or four years now on uh, intimate partner violence and computer security. You know, it can be a little bit depressing uh, to uh, think about and talk about. But uh, on the other hand, we have lots of room for improvement, and you can really uh, it's rewarding, I think, uh, having the hope that we can help people uh, improve their situation. Um, and with that, I think I'll just thank my, uh, many, my many awesome collaborators and uh, open up the floor to questions. Thank you very much.